Shell has ever. You're not. I say the teams we. I say make we move the playoffs, on to We're going to get the first overall pick. Let's let's move on to another series because we've kind of beat this one to death. We we get it. Um, the uh, Knights. You're, you're just the, losing the argument. I'm not. I'm not arguing either way. I just don't want to hear you screaming anymore. I won't hold you down. It's Toronto Maple Leafs related, so I figured it would be open territory. Well, I don't think I am. Uh, I don't think I'm in a position to give any advice or opinion on anything because my picks for NHL goalies yeah, starting all wrong. has been atrocious. <laughs> I saw yeah, that. Yeah, I am. I am in. The, I am in the East Coast League of picking goalies right now. Yeah. But go ahead, Alba. Let me let me lay into me here on this one. Right. So I didn't see the game. And my buddies who are all Leaf fans were saying how bad that goal was, the game-winning goal that Anderson gave up. So I wanted to ask you guys if you had any thoughts on it, if you thought it actually was that bad or if it was a good goal. It was not a good goal. It was not. No. But he also gave up one on 34, so. Yeah. The guy's allowed to make a mistake. Human being. Yeah. Gave him a chance to win. Yeah. So good goal? No. Did he play sick? Yeah. Fair. They yeah, couldn't get next anything question. Past, they couldn't get anything cast past uh, Corpus Allo, eh? My Six, boy. Yeah, he played pretty good. Yeah, he sixteen played million good. dollar offense. They can't get one goal. Jamie Jamie calls him my boy like they're buddies. <laughs> when it was yeah, a Jamie, single, off? it was a single fist pump in a, in a hallway crossing <laughs> that he, oh, he's clinging great. to. Oh, that's great. I like when guys are nice, man. I don't like when guys big talk. Well, he didn't big dog you, but he also felt sorry for you because you just gave up seven on 14. So, Well, no, we actually won that game, so I don't, he lost. So you tell me. Why don't you tell a story? Because I know the story, but nobody else does. So I don't <laughs> okay. know the story. No, it's not. It's like I said, I, don't, I like when guys like don't big dog and like when superstars are nice guys. So we were playing in Cleveland, and Corpus Allo was up and down with Columbus at the time. He's backing up Bobrovsky. And in order for him to get some games, they would send him down. You play a weekend, just immediately go back up. They were playing us, and we ended up beating them 3-2 or 4-2. And in the hallway after the game, he's grabbed all his stuff because he's, he's going right back to the NHL where he makes millions of dollars. And I was out there just doing, like, my recovery stuff, and he walks by, and he's like, hey, great game. And it was a quick little fist bump, and he kept going. And I was right from right there. I was like, this guy's my favorite goalie of all time. That's sick. Oh, I like that. But it was better than like when I met Mike Smith and I was just sweating. I was sweating <laughs> significantly less. Do you uh, remember what episode you talked about meeting Mike Smith? Uh, I think anybody, was... If anybody didn't hear your Mike Smith story where you just sweat buckets, it needs to go back and listen to that. Uh, okay, let's talk NHL hockey. Because we actually have some NHL hockey to talk about. How, how good is Carey Price? Like, yeah, very. I, I hate the Habs. Very. I hate them. Watching the Habs is – in Fury because they're they're so soft, but they're so bad. How good? Carey Price is so good. How good is Carey Price? It's un- I want to see them win. I'm a Leaf fan, and that means I was born to hate the Habs. But I want to see the Habs win just so I can keep watching Carey Price. No, you're you're complete. Like it's he's on a different level. And it's one of those things where like you know he didn't have an amazing season, but. When he turns it on, it's it's incredible. And it's too bad that Montreal generates zero offense because they it would be they would sweep because Matt Murray is playing okay, but he's not playing particularly well. But Carey Price is a different type of human being. Matt yeah. Murray, Matt I'm not a Matt Murray fan, and Matt Murray was good last night. And I even have to admit that. But I'm the type of guy, every time they come over the top of the circle, I'm like, I'm holding my breath because I think he's going to get scored on. The guy, he yeah. just gets beat on shots. Like, he, mm-hmm. he gets beat on clean shots all the time. No, so as a, as a Montreal fan, every time they step over the blue line, I just want, I want pucks on net. But I don't, maybe it's just because he's not getting a lot of action. Like, he, he comes up with some big – he's got some big saves in both, in both games. But – there's just times where like his rebounds are like you texted us at like midnight talking about his, his trampoline on his chest. And it's true. Like his rebounds are blowing up. He looks awkward sometimes, but I mean, I'm, if Pittsburgh wins and they move on, I'm curious to see how he'll do against 
like a re- real offense because Montreal is it's a one man show and it's Carey Price and for any he, he's not going to go score goals but a big shout out to Hamilton boy Ben Sherratt guys playing thirty minutes a night with Shea Weber and uh, making himself uh, carving himself a pretty good NHL career but do you remember he used to be one of our shooters back in the day right? he was he yeah. uh, he's actually like the poster boy for like when the Jets bring in like young D where they just talk about taking your time and developing and doing, putting in the work. He is the poster boy for that because that's what he did. He started in the American league, put in work when he first got to the NHL, like people were really hard on him and saying, he's, he's you know, he's never going to make it. He's terrible. He's too slow. He's doing all these things. But you know, he, if you want to talk about trusting the process, he's example one one And like you just said, like he's eating minutes with Shea Weber right now. And he's doing a good job. Yeah, I mean that that's a guy you want to be playing with, Shea Weber. Just get Shea Weber to step over the blue line, take a slap shot. He's, you have an eighty percent chance of it going either low block or high glove. Yeah, he only he only does that in practice on the third goalie. <laughs> poor poor Michael McNiven, his brain got just ripped off by Shea from Weber. From the top of the, from the top of the oh, circle. Yeah. Welcome welcome to Black Acing Kid. Yeah. Yeah. Legit. Legit. Uh, what, else? what other what other goalie stories can we talk about? So Mike Smith, my bold prediction that Mike Smith would carry the Edmonton Oilers to the Stanley Cup. Crawford kind of gone up in tire fire. Corey Crawford, Crawford is top go last night on game two. Oh, he wasn't good in game one either. He has been he has been not good. Yeah. Miko Koskin and I text you guys. There's I been, think he's terrible. There's but been 19 goals scored in those two games in the Edmonton Miko, Chicago yeah. series. Koskin could be so good, but all of his goals are a result of him being an RVH from the second the other team starts to break it in, break in the zone. He just hangs out in RVH, and like then he tries to make all his, his saves from that position. He gets beat. Just, just hold your feet. Just hold your feet. Do the do the okay. Rangers give uh, Lundqvist the night off after losing to Carolina? Down two nothing. Or do they just keep going with him? Well, they I can't play. Shester- they can't play Shesterkin because he's hurt. Uh, that's why he's not starting. Hello, Gorgiev. I mean, yeah, but also like Lundqvist hasn't been playing terrible. But I didn't mean, they Gorgiev have lost start or have the most minutes for them during the regular season? I believe so. I mean, it should have like been Gorgiev, just, just shirking from the beginning, but injuries. Okay, I have a, yeah, I have a legit... Gorgiev took over the number one job from Lundqvist. So to yeah. be to have any hesitation to go to Gorgiev for game three, I don't know why there would be any hesitation. Unless they really want that Lafreniere pick and give Hendrick the, you know, King Hendrick. This is prob- It would probably be his last game as a Ranger. You would player i mean whether he takes over in some sort of role on the staff or he goes somewhere else who knows but i think that this is the end of lundquist in new york as a goalie right yeah. I, I agree you, and, so, have like, think that. and i don't think the rangers are going to win the series so i think that maybe out of respect for what lundquist did throughout his career you just give him one last shot at it Okay, yeah. be- before we let Albo ask his question, because we cut him off. As a coach and as a player, there's no way you have that mentality. You have that mentality as a guy sitting on a couch in Michigan. But you yeah. can't tell a coach or a player, oh, you know what, we're going to give him a swan song in a game three of a playoff series. You're out of your damn mind. No, you, but it, you, de- it depends. You aren't far enough removed. You, hang on. You're not far enough removed from a dressing room to say, oh, give him the night off. Are you out of your – where are you getting this idea from? It, it depends if the organization has decided that they want – They'd rather, at this point of the game, take that shot at number their best opportunity, number one pick or not. And you think you think coaches who could get fired at the end of the year or GMs who get fired at the end of the year have that mentality? The only guys that would have possibly have that mentality are like presidents or director of hockey operations. You can't tell a coach who gets paid to win hockey games or might lose his job that you know what we're, we're hopefully we lose this round so that we get Lafreniere when you might get fired in September. Look, I don't call the shots. I'm just some guy and a coach. Like you said, who knows? We'll see. 
What if it comes out right. and that's and that was the mindset? There's there's no way. What if it comes if it comes out and that's the mindset? We're having a prompt you. If episode. it comes out and that's the mindset, then that is a that is um, conflict of interest, and everybody in New York will get fired. Fans would revolt. Are you out of your mind? Come on. There's not, no yeah. possible way. You cannot tell a coach to not try and win. I don't care what it is because coaches are on contracts that can be terminated hour by hour. Lundqvist isn't going to lose you the game. Their team is not he good might. enough to win them. It doesn't matter. That's just a mentality thing. You can't, as a competitor, look how, look how angry I am just at you saying stupid things like this. As a competitor, a guy with competitive needs, you can't go into a game without putting 100% effort into trying to win. Yeah, Lundqvist is going to put 100% effort in. Of course Lundqvist is, but you're talking about the organization as a whole wanting to sandbag game three. No, I don't think it's a sandbag. It's Lundqvist has played the last but two also, games. He hasn't also, played terrible. And if they lose, Lundqvist plays the last game. You're fired. And also, Derek, I don't think it's real. I'm not a GM. You're, you're Sorry, trying no. to make it sound like this has never happened before, but NHL okay. teams have absolutely sandbagged entire seasons before. So it's not impossible. Seasons, Albo, seasons. Regular seasons when they're already out of the playoffs and there's 15 <laughs> games left and they're 40 points out. Sure, they'll play a third string guy. They'll bring up guys, the young guys. Not in know, the I Stanley understand. Cup playoffs. They're not in the playoffs yet. You're telling okay. me, they, they, well, these are the playoffs. They, these are the NHL playoffs. As per the rules, they are now they're, in the playoffs. So there is no team in the history of the NHL that has sandbagged a Stanley Cup playoff series. Yeah, no team in the history of the NHL has ever. You're not. I say the teams we. I say make we the playoffs. To we're going to get the first overall pick. Let's let's move on to another series because we've kind of beat this one to death. We we get it. Um, the oh, Knights. You're, you're just the, losing the argument. I'm not. I'm not arguing either way. I just don't want to hear you screaming anymore, this guy. That's good enough. There's. Uh, did you see Saros got the start against uh, the Coyotes? Yeah, I but did. I'll give it to you twenty-five. I mean, they lost. Did they, did they go to Pekka here? I don't know. They, they were both very bad in the season. Yeah. That's, that, you'd have to think that that's like a uh, who looks better out of this little mini training camp kind of start. Yeah, I don't know. Hopefully not a seniority thing. Saros had a, had a tough go. Did you see that goal, that the first goal of the game there, that like bounced off Duchesne's chest and like ricocheted like, over his head and in the net? Bounce off yeah. four things. Well, if he was six foot four, he would have made the same. Yeah. That's what they. That's what they yeah. said on the feed. <laughs> they go. He just has to be taller. <laughs> I think, and that's like a situation where if you're taller, it just hits you. But hundred percent. I I don't he know. As, no a, idea as a guy, as a guy who's not responsible for three goalies under six foot, I uh, I'm not saying anything about small goalies for a year. True. Uh, back to this. I got the, the text from you that. Uh, I now feel old because none of my goalies have ever heard of Mika Kippersoff. Oh, well, so, so what am I, yeah, me. so, so I, I have like a group, I have a group chat with my goalies and I just send clips of the highlights and I just, we, we break them down. We talk about it, things I think are teaching points so that, you know, we're all on the same page when we get to camp. And so hang on, just a quick intermission. So you mean you send me a clip, ask me about it. I send it back to you. Then you send it to them with the teaching points. Okay, no, I sent going. you. I sent you one clip after the fact. Derek, you're such a cocksucker. I sent you one <laughs> clip after the fact, and your answer was terrible. Anyways. My answer was dead on. I can go through the text messages if you want. Well, no. The answer was, <laughs> do you head check or not? And your answer is no, no. And then you said all this other stuff. Then I told you the right answer. And you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Are you talking about the Talbot goal? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, okay. keep going. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, story's ruined. No, no, keep going. So you send them clips and then teaching points. Oh, and then one of, one of the guys sent a clip of Staylock, who is very 1970s. My favorite and, goal in the league. Continue. How did he start that game? I don't understand. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, Evan Dubnik looks real shaky. Like he's, oh, my God. He's looking real shaky. <laughs> Anyways, so one of the saves, he did like a hop, skip, and a jump to yep. get across. And he posted that in the group and it kind of like, kind of like, just like, what do you think of the shuffle? And I said, it's very Mika Kipper soft circa 2006. And he, he goes, who? And I was like, what? 
<laughs> you oh, no. not know who that is. You oh, it's no. It's called the Kiprasov Hop. I know. It's been named after the guy. And then I was like, oh. are, you, are you serious? He's like, and he's like, I just searched him. I guess I was like six or seven at the time, so I didn't really know. And I was like, well, yeah, I guess, but still. If you're, if you're not obsessed with goalies when you're seven years old, I, I mean, I know I oh. was. I knew so that was my whole life, basically. All right, guys, we got a special guest today, especially with the NHL playoffs going on. The uh, uh, president of the operations, the Chicago Blackhawks. Is that the VP official of hockey title? Oper- VP of hockey operations uh, affiliate and with their affiliates as well. Yeah, so he, he this guy's in charge of running the Rockford Ice Hogs and the affiliates of the Chicago Blackhawks. Works hand in hand with the Bowmans, multiple time Stanley Cup champion and former goalie, and he is from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, God's country. So let's welcome Mark Bernard to the show. How's it going, Mark? Good. How's everyone there? Everybody, I'm good. Great. I can't speak for everybody else, but I'm I'm great. Doing swell. Have you uh, opened up? Have you started uh, back to work with the privates and different things? Yeah, we started doing classes uh, June 1st, so we're about eight weeks in now. Is it uh, you're allowed limited amount of people in the building, or are you full go? Uh, well, they just passed. We're into phase three now, so we can have up to 50 people if social distancing is, I don't know, available or whatever. Or, yeah. Uh, but we can. But we're just doing two. We're doing semi-private, so everything is two goalies maximum. Uh, and then we got four or five guys in the gym in their squares. Yeah. Well, that's not yeah. bad. No. It's better than it's, the alternative. Uh, definitely better than the alternative, which was doing nothing for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how we all feel. You know, it's uh, boring as hell right now. <laughs> well, it's exciting for you guys now. You guys got playoffs started up. Yeah. that's That's been nice the last few days, having uh, a lot of games to watch. And obviously with our team competing right now, um, you know, it's uh, – exciting old school I think hockey kind of like 80s hockey with the playing the Oilers and the high scoring and um, you don't want to be a defenseman or a goalie in the in those games yeah it's been it's been kind of like you look at some of the series and it's been really low scoring and then you look at some series and there's a lot of scoring uh, it's kind of all over the map and I think a lot of it has to do with the, the break but also like with you guys with Edmonton some of those guys coming back a little bit healthier not so banged up well, if with Edmonton, the biggest thing is their power play, you know, with Dry Settle and, and McDavid and you go down their list, Nugent Hopkins, and they're just, they were 28 or 29%, I think, this year in the league, the highest ever. Um, you've got to stay out of the box or else they'll just, they'll just pick you apart. Uh, I think five on five, we match up really well. Uh, Corey, you know, uh, he hasn't been on the ice, he's been on the ice for a little over a week um, after, after being sick with COVID, so I think he's going to continue to get stronger as we go through the series. And, you know, tomorrow night will be an interesting game. I we had Viz, uh, Mark Byzantine was on. And- you know what? He is such a great kid. Um, I was excited when we signed, you know, when I signed him to an American League deal. And he, I felt so bad. You know, I know he had his injuries and with his, uh, and then he did his other foot, his other ankle. And I just felt awful for him. And uh, I especially didn't like the fact I had to get dressed, you know, because it happened, <laughs> it happened like five minutes into the game, four minutes into the game. And I, I emailed someone at the league and I said, hey, you know, we just lost our goalie four minutes into the game. If, if our other guy gets hurt, you know, what happens? And they're like, well, you got two options. You can sign a PTO right now and be available. Or you don't sign the PTO if another guy gets hurt. You got to put a, you got to put another player in that. You can't sign a PTO at that point. And I was like, oh, I signed a, I signed a PTO and and got dressed. But I felt awful, awful for Viz because that kind of, that was the end of his uh, his run. But he worked so hard at, at his rehab and coming back, and he had played well for us. And uh, we thought there was a lot of potential there. Yeah, one of the hardest working guys I've seen growing up, and just a bull and he even said that he goes there was nothing that he didn't think he could outwork any of the injuries and that just it was it was nice to see him get to the nhl level and play at that level and play world juniors it just sucks that 
kind of injuries gotten away for him, but that's you know, sometimes it's, it's, reality. It's kind of like uh, Brian Finley, you know. I don't know. Yeah, played in Barry, and um, he had bad groins. And it just plagued him everywhere he went once he was pro, and he never really could make it to the top of that mountain but he worked so hard on his rehab and you, you just feel for those guys you know they're doing everything possible they can and their body just isn't cooperating um, Do you remember uh nick nick pajot yes yes he's working out in the gym right here beside me i told him that we had johnny want me to say hi to you <laughs> um you know I, I was hoping to get home this summer back to hamilton and um obviously with everything going on that's not going to happen but it's uh there's so many good people and good friends. You know, I love seeing guys around our area do well. Like I love watching Cam Talbot right now, you know, in the, in the playoffs. I'm, I'm so glad that Calgary gave him a starting, you know, the first two games and he played well. Um, it's great seeing guys, you know, at any level from, from Hamilton in our area do well. So Mark, I had a question. Can you explain your role with the Chicago Blackhawks for those that might not understand it? Sure. So my title is uh, I'm the vice president of hockey operations and slash affiliates, which basically, you know, I do a lot of uh, my office is in Chicago full time. And uh, I'll kind of back up when I first came on, I uh, had joined the team in, uh, they were still located in Norfolk, Virginia. Chicago had their American hockey League team in Norfolk, Virginia. And I went there as the assistant general manager, uh, in a, you know, helping with my best friend, Al McIsaac. And uh, was there about a month or two. And I had been running teams in Europe before that. And I took over as the president of the team. And then when Chicago moved the team to Rockford, they were there for about a year. And then Dale Talon hired me to come in as the general manager of minor league affiliations. So I looked after everything to do with Rockford. And then I've since, you know, kind of climbed up the, the pole a little bit. And, uh, you know, Stan Bowman, Al McIsaac, um, have, have been so great to me right from day one and in my involvement, you know, because Rockford, Chicago is only an hour between the two. Um, I was always in there for meetings, uh, the draft preparations or at the draft and free agency and the trade deadline and in and all the meetings. And never once was I made to feel like the minor league guy, you handle the minor league team. And um, even now, you know, when I got it a couple of years ago, uh, Stan and, uh, Stan and uh, Al, you know, made sure they're like, hey, we want you on, uh, you know, all the flights. You know, if you want to travel, you travel. Um, if you need to be in Rockford, you go to Rockford. And, um, you know, so, but they wanted me to still oversee everything in Rockford because I've been doing it for so long. It's been, you know, we didn't want to have any hiccups. And I'm very fortunate they let me uh, hire an assistant GM, a uh, gentleman, young kid by the name of Nick Anderson, who's got a bright future in this sport. And he helps me with a lot of the day-to-day -day out there since I'm only out there maybe once or twice a week now. But I'll see about 130 games a year between uh, the two teams. And I'll also make a few trips down to Indianapolis to watch our ECHL fill it, the, uh, the Indy Fuel. So I'm kind of involved in everything. Um, I know that was kind of a wide variety, you know, answer. But, um, you know, the signing of free agents in Rockford, I'll work with our, uh, our, our pro scouting department on that. Um, you know, making trades at the minor league level, um, you know, doing different projects in Chicago for Stan or Al, and, and basically making a travel schedule for myself, whether it be with the NHL team or the American League team. So I'm pretty busy once the season is in, you know, in full swing. I saw Michael's oh, hand up. Yeah, I got a question about um, your, your post-playing career. Um, after having such a long uh, playing career, Clearly, you wanted to stay in the game. So, talk about your your transition out of playing and and into the kind of uh, behind the scenes role. Did you consider uh, coaching, like being like behind the bench at all? And the the second part of that would be like, I want to know about like your your first role in hockey post playing. Like, what was that like? Well, I first got a I got to give a shout out to a a man that if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't even be in hockey. Um, you know, I was uh, back in, I think it was 1986, I was drafted to the OHL and I was, I think, fifth round or sixth round, early sixth round. It was high at that point. I think I was the fourth goalie overall. And 
question. And I had a, a coach and general manager in Bill LaForge that um, I just, we just didn't get along. And um, he didn't get along with the goalie prior to me. That was also a Hamilton native, Peter Richards. So when Peter, oh, yeah. when Peter Richards left, I think he just uh, – he took it on me next and um, going into my third year in the OHL, like I never played. I just sat on the bench for two years. My third year, we moved to uh, Niagara Falls to become the Niagara, you know, Niagara Falls Thunder. And uh, about a month in, I, I just had had enough. I hated hockey, to be honest. I absolutely hated it. I was mentally fried. I just quit hockey. And probably about the second week of November, I got a phone call from a gentleman in Owen Sound, Ontario, by the name of Ray McKelvey. He was running the junior B team in Owen Sound. Um, and this was the year before they got the major junior A team. And he went through a, a, a litany of things and said, you know, I saw you as a 16 year old, why aren't you playing? And I explained it all. And he said, listen, why don't you come up to Owen Sound and give it till Christmas. I was in about the second week of November, give it till Christmas. If you're not having fun, you know, then go home. So I said, I'll, I'll think about it. When's your next practice? And he said, well, we practice tonight at like 6.30 or 7 o'clock. And Owen sounds about two hours from my house. I got off the phone. I thought about it for about an hour. I called him back and I said, I'll be there for practice tonight. And I, I jumped in my car. I drove up there and started having fun again, you know, and, and started enjoying the sport. And, you know, when you're having fun and you're enjoying yourself, as you know, you're going to play better. And I don't know who saw me or how it happened, but, you know, from there I went to the, the next year to the Bruins rookie camp. But um, if it wasn't for Ray McKelvey, I probably wouldn't be in hockey today. I would have went to work at the Fasco or Stalco or one of the mills and uh, like my brother and my dad, and that would have been it. But, you know, I was very lucky, played a long time in the minors. Um, I absolutely loved hockey. You know, I just loved playing. And even in 2001, when – my last year in Toledo, uh, the plan was to play again back over in Europe. I had been over in Europe four years prior to that. Um, my wife and I made the decision. She was pregnant at the time and wanted my son to be born in the, uh, in the USA so he'd have dual citizenship. So we played in Toledo that year, and they wanted a, an older goalie to mentor a, a young draft pick, a Detroit draft pick. So I was there with them, and um, I was going to go back to Europe, and then my knee went, and I had a uh, I think it was like my fourth procedure on my knee and that was it. And I, uh, I was at that point, you know, I, I realized probably five, six years into my playing career that, you know, listen, the NHL isn't in the cards for me or it's going to be tough to be even a full-time American league guy. I was always the call up, always go up. I'd sit on the bench the one year. I think I sat on the bench for like 50 or 60 games in Baltimore, backing up Byron Defoe and Mike Parsons and, um, on an off night, I would fly down the Hampton Roads to play for my ECHL team. So I was called up the second week of the third week of the season. I stayed till the week before playoffs, and I still played 27 games in the East Coast League. So I was back and forth all year. And But the one thing I, I did want to do is coach and uh, or be in hockey. And I figured if I'm not going to make it as a player, I want to try and make it as a coach. I wasn't thinking an executive at that time. And um I began to really follow my coaches around and ask a lot of questions and I'd stay in the office afterwards and kind of mentor my GM, be a, you know, watch my GMs and uh, what they did on a day-to-day -day basis. And when I got injured and I wasn't going to play, uh, a good friend of mine had just become the head coach of the Roanoke Express in the ECHL. And he hired me right away. And, uh, you know, that was uh, quite the experience and I was there for a year and I was in charge, you know, I was worked with him recruiting and kind of learning the coaching role. And I had a lot of trouble though. Like I, I still felt I could play. So it was really tough at times, you know, when you're coaching and you feel, you still feel you can play. Um, I had played 56 games a year before plus playoffs and uh, you know, but I went through it. I loved it. And then, I took an assistant coaching job and back in Toledo uh, so I could be closer to home. You know, we'd been away so much. Uh, we wanted to be closer to my family and my wife's family. She's from Bimbrook, Ontario as well. And, um, you know, our baby was Jackson was only a year old at the time. So we wanted to be closer to home. And uh, that was really the start of where I realized what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I had a, a head coach by the name of 
first head coach. And he had been in the American League and IHL for the most part of his coaching career. And he didn't really know too much about the ECHL, but he was a fantastic coach. So he kind of left it to me because I knew the league, you know, frontwards, backwards, sideways, every way. And he said, listen, you handle the salary cap, the travel, the recruiting, trades. You know, you run the defense and the PK and I'll handle the rest. And I kind of laughed. I said, what's left? And uh, I, by doing everything that year, I really fell in love with the management side. And I knew, though, to do that, I was going to have to continue to coach and work my way into that role. And that took me to the next year. I got the head coaching job in Rockford and then had the opportunity to go back overseas to England and be a coach for two years. And that's where I really uh, kind of stepped in it um, because I took a job as a coach and GM of the team. And the, <laughs> the first uh, meeting I had with the owner, he explained to me that we're not going to win. He goes, I don't give you a big enough budget, which as a head coach, you really don't want to hear that. And he just said, you know, I want you to be competitive and we got to stop losing too much money. And um, I said, well, what's your staff say? Like as far as corporate sales and merchandise and marketing and all those kind of things. And he goes, I got a feeling nobody filled you fully in on what you're doing here. So I was in charge of everything. I was the only person in the office. I did all the corporate sales, the merchandise, the marketing, the season tickets. I started a pro shop. Um, I spend about 95% of my time on those 5% of my time coaching. And after the year, we had cut his deficit in a little bit more than half in what he had lost the previous year. So he was thrilled, so happy that he now made me the arena general manager as well. And uh, so now I had a staff of about probably 15 to 20 full-time employees and then another 20 part-time. I had to go to call the local college, get my liquor license so I could be the manager, like the licensee of the bar. And then, uh, so now I'm the GM of the team, the GM of the, the, the building and the head coach. So on a, a typical day, a Tuesday, and, and Jamie, you were over there, like a typical Tuesday. Monday's always a day off for the players over there in England. Tuesday, I'd go into the rink. Because I'm there, I don't need any other managers on duty because that's a waste of money. So I would be there running everything. I'd be doing the Zamboni, you know, the cuts. I'd run our team through practice, get off the ice, take my skates off, and I'd do the Zamboni so the figure skaters could get on next because all the arenas over there are multi-use. They're not just for your team. Um, I was doing everything. You know, I would be after our game on a Saturday night, I'd be at the rink till 2 in the morning till the girls got the bar closed up. Um, so, you know, I was doing a little bit of everything. And then the topper came in mid-November when I haven't had my equipment on now for four and a half years. It's been in storage in Canada, in Hamilton. And uh, it was a Wednesday afternoon. My goalie uh, came to me and told me that he had, was deciding he was going to go home. And I'm like, all right, well, we'll see you tomorrow. Like, no, I'm going home. I've had enough. So I'm sitting on the couch that night, and I can't even use the words that my wife used, but she basically <laughs> said, oh, don't tell me you're, you're thinking what I think you are. And I'm like, I don't have a, a choice because – uh, especially back then in the mid nineties, you know, the British goalies were okay, but they were more your backups and they're going to play third period or mop up duty and give you a break if you needed it, but they weren't starting games um, at that point. And I got my equipment shipped over. My mom and dad got it out of storage, got it to uh, a buddy on my, on my team. His parents were flying over on the Friday. They flew it over. Uh, I got it Friday night around midnight and I started on Saturday at home and then played on Sunday in uh, Nottingham and Monday came and I couldn't get out of bed. Uh, after four <laughs> off and, uh, um, but I, I had so much fun and my goal was to find a starting goalie and uh, all that week looked around, couldn't find a goalie. Come Saturday night, I start again late in the third period, score an empty net goal. You know, played that week, wow. played the, the next week in practice again, played the next week. Now I've played about six games. I feel pretty good, and we're doing okay. And what we ended up doing is I, I took the money that I, you know, I had allotted for a goaltender. I cut a defenseman, combined the two salaries, and brought a really good defenseman uh, over from Germany. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I played net the rest of the year. So now I'm the head coach. Starting 
Atlanta played, I think, uh, 37 or 38 games that year. And, you know, if you look at my stats, I think I looked like a stay-at-home defenseman. I had one goal, four assists, and 88 penalty minutes. But uh, I, got, I got your elite prospects up right here. Yeah. That is you know, absolutely amazing. So that year, that year you went, you played 32 games. And you had a save percentage of 903. Yeah. We were playing for, yeah, five years. After four and a half years off to have over 90 save percentage, that was okay. I was, I was That's happy. pretty good. That's on, a, yeah. on, a team that, on a team that only had 10 wins. That's I think I was fifth, If you click on the penalty minutes, I think I was probably fifth on the team in penalty minutes. But, um, you know, we weren't very good. We competed because we didn't have – we were about a third of the budget. Like if other teams were spending nine, ten thousand 10,000 pounds per week on salary, we were spending three, 3,200. Um, you know, so – we, we worked hard, we, but, you know, to make a long story short, without the experience of going to England and having to do all those jobs, like I was, you know, if I didn't have the program into print by Monday at four o'clock, it wasn't ready for the weekend. You know, I was writing the newspaper article that would go into the newspaper after every weekend. Um, I was writing the press releases. You know, the funniest, I had to write a press release on myself saying, you know, Head coach and general manager Mark Bernard thrilled to announce the signing of uh, goaltender Mark Bernard. <laughs> so <laughs> that one, but I mean, I was doing so many jobs that if I screwed up at one, I learned so quickly because I couldn't afford to screw up again because I didn't have the time. And that really prepared me for the next year. Like it was probably about two weeks after the season ended when Al McCullough called me and said, hey, you know, Chicago and the, the owner in North are going to hire an assistant GM here. You're going to have to work on the business side as well, but, and help me with the hockey stuff. Are you interested? I said, yeah. He's like, well, could you come for an interview? And I'm just like, yeah, definitely. He goes, how about, can you be here tomorrow? I'm like, it's nine o'clock Thursday night. I go, he goes, yeah, I know, but there's a flight leave at, uh, at 6 a.m. It would get you in here at like 2 p.m., get a rest and come to the game tomorrow night. They'll interview you. And I was on that flight, and uh, that was a Friday night. I, I sat with the owner, and I spent a lot of time playing. At the time, they were called the Hampton Roads Admirals in the early 90s, playing for John Brophy, and we'd won a couple um, uh, Jack Riley Cups, which was – then it became the uh, Kelly Cup, but we won a couple championships down there. And the fans all kind of took to me when I started playing there. And uh, I got the job, and – I said I was the assistant GM for about the first six, seven weeks, and then I got promoted to the president of the team. And, uh, and it kind of went from there. And we had two years of great crowds, and the ownership made money. And, uh, and then the Blackhawks hired me and, and brought me uh, to Chicago. And it was on, luckily for me, it was at a great time. It was right, you know, in 2008, right before we went on a great run there. But again, all of this, you know, there's so many different factors, but you look back on your life and what you do for a living and there's key people that come into play. And one was Ray McKelvey for me, obviously Al McIsaac, who's we've been best friends since 91, since we played together in Hampton roads and then uh, getting the opportunity to go to England and, and kind of run everything from the top to the bottom, including driving the Zamboni. So, um, you know, I know other coaches used to get kind of pissed off over there because their owners were getting on them saying, well, he's doing everything over there. Why can't he do that here? And, they're like, because we don't want to. And, uh, but it was a great experience. And it, 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 it was the foundation for, for what we have today. <laughs> that was probably a longer answer than you expected. That was a good oh, answer. That was way better than I expected. Yeah, it, was <laughs> but, uh, it was kind of I was funny wondering. When, I, when I scored my goal, too, you know, it was nice because my parents were over there. And I came in the dressing room after I scored it. And, uh, all the young kids on the team, like the younger British players, were all excited. And I said, yeah, that's my, my second goal in six games. It's pretty good. And they're like, what? And I go, well, I scored four and a half years ago, right at the end of my career when I was in Toledo. I scored an empty netter. So they were all laughing. But I didn't even think if it was going to make it down the ice because, you know, you're, when you haven't played in that long, your, your wrists aren't that strong. And I, I knew I had the, the line on the net. And I was like, oh, please just go in. And it made it, I don't, it didn't hit the back of the net. That's for sure. Maybe made it like a half a foot over the red line. It was still. <laughs> if, a, it, if the guy driving the Zamboni wasn't doing such a good job, it wouldn't have made it. So. <laughs> no, that, that's for sure. Like, you know, I, yeah. I've been so lucky in my, you know, my, my playing career and my post career, like. 
she can score two goals is phenomenal. And, you know, I have, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to set the pro hockey record for most assists in a game by a goalie um, with four. And that, that was when I was playing over in England as well. And um, I, I could probably give you guys 50 guesses each. You'd never guess who ha holds the NHL record for most assists in a game, which was the pro hockey record at that time. And uh, I don't think you'd ever get it. Former, I'll even give you a hint, former Calgary Flame. Grant Mike Fuhrer. Vernon. No, I thought I would have thought of uh, Fuhrer too in the Edmonton days, like maybe kick yeah. down the ice or something. But it was uh, it was Jeff Reese. Oh, oh Jeff wow. Reese. You yeah, should have known that album. He got yeah. three. He got three against. Uh, I think it was the San Jose Sharks in their expansion year. Yeah, uh, I got home from and probably about three weeks after I, I did it and. I got a phone call from Craig Campbell at the Hockey Hall of Fame wanting the stick. And I thought it was one of my buddies messing around. I hung up and he called back and he goes, no, that happens all the time. People always hang up on me. And <laughs> my dad and I made a trip down to Toronto and we gave them my stick. And it's, uh, you know, they, they've got so many great items there. It goes in and out on the, in the European section, but they got my stick there. And uh, it was kind of cool to be able to later on, you know, when my son was playing hockey, now take him in this – and said, you better make sure my stick's on display. I'm coming there next week. And uh, it was cool to, to, to be able to see it. Now, That's awesome. being a player, coach, Sam Boyinger, everything involved in, you know, the UK hockey. And I saw, you know, I saw sometimes a little bit of a wild west out there. I was curious on what your, your thoughts are around, how, like, why the league – really hasn't blown up as much as some other European leagues in terms of getting talent and skill because, you know, the league's been around for a long time. There's a lot of great players in it, but it doesn't really get the respect, um, you know, that other European leagues do or the draw that other European leagues do. Well, for me, uh, Jamie, I, I think it just comes down to financials. You know, it, it just, uh, they don't pay the salaries in England that they would in, you know, in Russia or Austria or Sweden or Finland, or wherever it might be. And, um, great building. Like you've been over there, you go into Sheffield and Nottingham, you know, in Nottingham, you'll have 8,000 people and Sheffield, you have 7,000 Belfast always has a good crowd. You know, Coventry is a, a, about what, 3,500, 4,000 seat building. Um, when I went over there in 96, uh, there was a, a, a good friend of mine. I'd worked hockey schools in the summer. He's from Brantford, Scott Rex. And, um, he was w coaching in, over there. And he called me because, you know, this is pre-computers and all that kind of good stuff. And I was finishing up the year in Hampton Roads. We were in playoffs. And he said, hey, they're going to start a new league over here next year called the Super League. Um, the imports were going to go from being allowed three imports to 13 imports. And you're going to be allowed, I think, six or eight work permits. So if, uh, if a Canadian player needed a work permit, you're allowed eight. I didn't need a work permit because – my grandmother was born and raised over there. So I had a, uh, a pass uh, that I could use to get over and, and I was allowed to work, which made me even more valuable. And it was kind of funny because I, I, I faxed him my resume. He said, fax me your resume. I'm going to be at the, uh, you know, for those people that don't know over in England, it's kind of like the, the final four for hockey here too. Like they do a finals weekend and he was going to be there at the finals. It was being hosted that year in Wembley stadium. And he goes, all the coaches that are going to be in the league next year will be here. Send me your resume. I'll hand it out. So I sent it over to him on the Friday morning. We were in playoffs. We got beat out on Saturday night. Sunday morning, I got called Rochester Americans. Uh, so I'm in the hotel Monday morning getting ready to go to practice. And I get a phone call from, some, from a coach over there, uh, the Bracknell Bees. And he right away offers me a, a contract for the next year, a one-year deal. And it was, you know, when you do the conversion rate and what I was making at the time in East Coast, like it was more money. You're guaranteed 32 weeks of pay. And I went, well, that's not bad. Let me think about it. I'll call you back later today. I got back from practice. I had another team called me, called the Basingstoke Bison. And they offered me a two-year contract at a little bit better money. So I called the original team back and I said, listen, you know, if you can do a two-year deal for a little bit more money, I'll come to you because – you know, this other team has called maybe an offer. And I didn't recognize or realize at the time that these two cities, Bracknell and Basingstoke, were only about 20 minutes apart and uh, big rivals, big, big rivals. 
to my basing stoke, basing stoke. You know, he goes, I'll call you right back. And he hung up. I get a call like 15 minutes later and he goes, I'll give you a three year contract. And he basically doubled my money. And I was like, if you fax that to the holiday and right now, I'm going to sign that contract. And it, I was done. It was done, you know, within, within probably that day, I started the calls at seven in the morning and by five o'clock that night, I had a three year contract guaranteed over in England. And um, my wife was like, she worked for Canada trust at the time. She's, kept checking the exchange rate. She's like, it's like 2.53 right now to the pound. So you better take that contract. And uh, that's how I got over there. And it was a great experience. I loved it. You know, and we had the, the quality of the hockey was probably between the most like an American league. But again, it just would never go to that next level because, you know, they just, I don't think they get the corporate sponsors that they do over in other big countries to help with the salaries. And uh, so that I think holds them back. And, you know, the best year, my fourth year, Bracknell was a very small town and we got small crowds, great ownership. It was fun. You know, I felt bad. They put, took me into the arena the first day. I'm right off the plane and I'm like, oh, is this the practice rink? And they're like, uh, no, this is our rink. And I'm like, oh, okay. Sorry about that. And it was like 2,000 people, 2,300 people right on top of you. Uh, my fourth year, I signed in Manchester, the Manchester Storm. And we played out of MEN Arena, and we were averaging 8,000 fans a night. There was a few nights where they opened the, you know, the top level. We'd get 12 or 13,000 fans a night. And we played in uh, the European Hockey League, which is now called the Champions League, and uh, went to Switzerland for training camp for two weeks. You know, it was just the experience alone that playing over there brought me was, you know, was priceless. And uh, I, I wouldn't change anything about it. It was a, it was a great experience. <clears throat> We, uh, I think the last time we talked before this, uh, we were talking about that kid that you guys signed out of uh, the D3 league, the kid that had a sub one goals against average. Tom Auburn. Was, yeah, Auburn. Norwich. And um, at a Norwich University, yeah. And uh, we, we, we did a little banner on that and talked about how he had unbelievable numbers. And it doesn't matter which league you're playing, if you put up numbers like that, you're going to turn some heads. Can you just talk a little bit about the guy as a guy who signs the free agents for the AHL and the East coast, where you're finding these goals and how you find them. And is it just somebody sending you a name or you out watching and recruiting and actively looking for guys? Well, you know, it, it's, it kind of varies, you know, I've been knock on wood. I've been lucky with goaltenders. Um, when I first got here, one of my first few years, uh, one of the first goalies I ever signed was Carter Hutton. And Carter had just graduated from school. He had played one year pro, mostly, uh, you know, in the American League and didn't have a contract that next year. And I signed him to an American League slash ECHL contract because we needed um, a fifth goaltender in our organization. And um, Carter came in and had a great camp. He went to Toledo. Uh, that was our ECHL affiliate at the time and was playing. And they weren't a great team, but he was playing really well. And by Christmas because of injuries and different things. He was our number one goaltender in Rockford. And then, you know, by March, we flipped him from an American League deal over to an NHL contract and he backed up. And then we brought him back. He jumped up. He was number three in our chart the next year and played again with us and, and played his first NHL game. And uh, at the end of that year, signed in free agency with Nashville and has been in the NHL ever since. And, you know, he did that unbelievable first of all his character is 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 off the charts he's a great great human being works so hard um and he, he he's he's worked for everything he's ever got you know he never had a scholarship till like i think it was the beginning of august after his last junior year had ended i think you know his story was he wasn't far that far off of starting an apprenticeship uh you know in school because he didn't have anything he got he, I think it was UMass Lowell he went to um, and went all four years and then turned pro. And, but really with us is uh, where he really went, you know, got his game on track and played fantastic and worked really hard with our goalie coach uh, at the time, Andrew Allen. And, um, and then, you know, the next goalie that kind of came along for us was uh, Scotty Darling. Um, I saw Scotty Darling. I was down in Indianapolis or sorry, Toledo watching 
was Kenton and won that. And I'm watching, instead, I'm facing the other way the whole night, watching Scott Darling play for Wheeling. And uh, that summer, that next summer, he signed an American League deal with Milwaukee Admirals, who was one of Rockford's biggest opponents. And I went and saw him play. And, you know, after seeing him play against us, I went probably an additional five to ten times to see him play that year and uh, kind of kept pounding Stan Bowman about him. And, you know, to the point where I kind of shut up. I was like, Stan doesn't want to hear about this guy anymore. Just stop. So it was the end of the year. And Stan kind of came in my office and said, well, you really like the guy from Milwaukee, don't you? And I said, I really do. Like, I think he can play now. And we, we did all, you know, we all talk about things. It's not just one person in Chicago that signs a player. We, we have in-depth discussions about these players with their character, their on off ice things. And we all decided to, all, we would give them a one-year deal. And, you know, without Scotty Darling in 2015, we probably don't get past Nashville to, to go on our way to the cup. And, uh, but you know, it's a lot goes into it. It's not just one person. And, you know, Colin Dealey is another one. You know, Colin Dealey is a guy that Peter Aubrey loved. I loved. And he came to our development camp the one summer, and his footwork was just through the roof. It was phenomenal. It just set him apart from everyone. And he went back to Merrimack that year, and Peter really kept close tabs on him. And near the end of the year, we were talking about him. And then I started watching a lot more video on him. And, uh, you know, when I'd go back to Chicago, we started laying the groundwork. And we had good discussions about him and as an organization, we decided to offer him a contract and, you know, he, he's done great for us. So when it comes to Tom, you know, Peter Aubrey is very good for friends with the Norwich coach and he kept uh, bringing Tom's name up to Peter and then Peter started talking to me about it and we started watching a lot of video and uh, for me, he reminded me a lot of Carter Hutton and he plays, he's, you know, there's a reason where everybody plays where they play. And this young man is from France. Um, that's probably why, you know, he didn't have any D looks. He went to D3. And hard to ignore a guy, you know, when he's played 27 games, has like a 0.66 average and a 96.7 save percentage. And when the season ended, was on a nine-game shutout streak. And I watched, the, you know, the last games he got a shutout, and it was like a 31-save shutout. It wasn't like a 10, game, 10 saves. But very athletic. You know, he challenges shooters. He reads the plays well. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to watch how he does. You know, I'm excited to get him started here when uh, the American League starts up again. And he's a guy that will probably start in the ECHL. But we, uh, we love that league. We love it's a great league for young goaltenders to develop. And I'd rather a young goalie play games than sit on the bench and watch. You know, I think it's important that they're playing. And, uh, you know, we did the same thing with Colin Dealey. He went to Indianapolis, played – you know, 10 games before taking over the job in Rockford that year and also playing in the NHL that year. So uh, Tom's, you know, he's got great numbers at the D3 level, and I'm sure there's going to be an adjustment. But uh, I'm excited to see how he does. Yeah, I, I got one for you here, Mark. As a, Mark. Guy who's, as a guy who, like, sees so many games and so many goalies, and you're, you're always on the lookout for, for this guy and then – you end up seeing a guy at the other end of the ice that you like more. So my question is outside of like the, the technical side of being a goalie and making a saves um, like body language wise, what are you looking for in goalies that gives you a sense of, yeah, this is, this is a guy I like, or this is, this is something that I don't like. You know, I, I love guys at battle. I love a guy that, you know, he's competing in a, in, he might be losing the game six, one, and, he, and he's still competing as if he's winning it two to one. You know, I want a guy that's going to, you know, give his team that chance to win. And I, I had this conversation. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was in Cincinnati after a game with, Clark, uh, with Carter Hutton. And he was – they had lost the game down. And he was like, yeah, my numbers aren't great. And I go, I don't care about your numbers. I really don't. My biggest thing is are you giving your team a chance to win every night? And you're doing that. And, you know, that's going to translate into wins eventually. You know, a goalie coach told me uh, probably 100 years ago, like your goals against average and your save percentage are like a roller coaster. They're going to go up and down your whole career. But when you get a win, it stays in the win column forever. So I'd much rather win a game 7-6 than lose a game one nothing, because, you know, that win stays there forever. And give your team that, you know, that energy. Be that leader back there. Give them the chance to win and compete every night. And uh, – you know, I don't want to see a guy that's, you know, I, I hate the guy. 
you know, if, uh, if it deflects off or the fence, the, you know, the arms up in the air, instead of just, you know what, it happened. Give the guy a pat on the knee on you. You know, I, those kind of things really bother me. Um, I love watching guys that, you know, you could walk in a building in the third period without looking at the score clock. It might be, you think it's a 0-0 or one nothing game the way this guy's playing. And then you look up, they're losing 6-1. You know, you want that guy that's going to battle and, you know, just be a great teammate for you every day. I thought, Jamie, you had a question? Uh, well, I was just going to talk about just the East Coast and uh, Chicago. So when you got to Rockford and the Chicago Blackhawks, was there, I guess, the stream of development – uh, as strong as it was when you got there as it is now because they're out of the few teams in NHL that treat their East Coast leagues like they value it. Chicago was one of those teams that really t- takes advantage of using Indy. So I was curious what it was like when you first arrived. Well, I think we've always been that way. Um, it started with Al McIsaac um, because Al had a playing career in the East Coast League and then he was general manager of the Hampton Roads Admirals for I think six or seven years before – uh, they became the American League farm team of the Blackhawks. And then he was there, the GM for seven years. So he has a strong tie. He had very strong ties to the ECHL, values what that league offers for young players. And then when I came along, I have all those same values. Um, I, you know, the ECHL, people might look at it like, oh, that league, you know, or whatever. It's still pro hockey. You're getting paid to do your, to, to make the living. And, when I was growing up, you know, all you wanted to do is play pro hockey and to be able to do that and make a living doing it, um, whether it's in the American League, ECHL, Europe, you know, I, I'm very proud of being able to play in the ECHL. And so with those strong ties, um, we were able to stay, you know, when I came on, we, our team was in Fresno and <laughs> my first year and we I got a call right before Christmas break that they were folding, that they were going to funk and we had five players out there. So I had to find homes, you know, for these five guys. And I was lucky to get them all in Gwinnett, you know, the Gwinnett Gladiators. Uh, now they're the Atlanta Gladiators. Um, and then the next year we started our affiliation, I think it was for five years with the Toledo Walleye. And then Indianapolis was getting a new team and, and that was a good fit. And we would be our own affiliate, you know, because in Toledo we shared with Detroit. And it's just been fantastic. We have a great owner in Jim Hallett. Um, we try and – players there like usually I have anywhere from five to nine players down there Uh, because you know every time we lose a player from Rockford that goes up to Chicago or a player gets injured you've got to have a strong nucleus of of players to come in and and be able to fill those spots on the roster and uh, you know I'm allowed to sign some guys and and put guys there that can come up and play and uh, it's 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 huge if you don't have that depth um, your season will get away from you in a quick hurry and uh, we've always managed to put goalies down there, you know, whether it be, um, you know, uh, Colin Delia or a Carter Hutton or, or whoever it might be. Um, sometimes we've had two down there. But um, you're always going to need a, a third or fourth goalie in the American League at some point during the season due to call-ups or injuries. And um, it makes it a lot easier as a general manager when I can just pick up the phone and call Indy and call a player up rather than trying to call around to all these different ECHL teams. And, you know, believe it or not, in this day and age, there's still coaches that don't answer their phone on a, on a Thursday or through the weekend because they know what you're calling for. They know that you're, they're, they're probably going to lose a player and they, they're, they don't want to lose their top player or top goaltender. Like, you know, them a game that weekend during your call, which is hard to believe. It still happens. And, uh, you know, with Indy having a strong affiliation there and having a, the ability through our owner to have the resources to sign some players to put there, uh, it works out very well for us. And we treat them, they're part of our organization. My job's not building the Indy Fuel. My job is to build a strong team for Rockford and for our organization. And, uh, you know, if we have some great players there that can come up and help us, that's, that's beneficial. You had played uh, in the United Hockey League in, in Rockford or a coach, I mean, in yeah. the United Hockey League. I've only heard stories about it. And was it that much uh, – was it a gong show league when you had played in it? <laughs> or coached in it, excuse me. It was uh, probably <laughs> gong show than the players. You know, I was so frustrated that year coaching because I took the job. I left Toledo where I loved 
coaching with Claude Noel, but I wanted to take the step be a head coach. And then two days, the day after I took the job in Rockford, Claude Noel got the job in Milwaukee. And Toledo wanted me to stay and be the head coach, but they'd already even done a pref they already done a press conference and everything in Rockford, and I couldn't really back out of it. It wouldn't have been the right thing to do. And I recruited what I felt was a really good team, but we had such a rash of injuries. Like I had eight of my top players within a month of the season starting have major injuries. They were out for like I had a guy, uh, Reggie Savage, who had played, he was a first rounder of the Washington Capitals played in the American League, played some games in the NHL. I, you know, I, brought, I recruited and brought him in. I knew him from my days with Baltimore. First game of the year, blows his shoulders, done for the year. You know, I had two players with broken orbital bones that were out for eight weeks. I had a player uh, retire, or, you know, a player, keep one of my best offensive forwards, retired and took a job as a policeman in Nashville. You know, I had two guys go out with knee injuries, and it was just never-ending. And then uh, I was told by ownership that we couldn't, you know, when a player would come, I'd have to find a player. Then I was told I couldn't bring any more players in. I had to use local guys because they couldn't afford to bring any more because I was paying so many players at that time. You know, because just because a player is injured, you're not going to not pay them. And uh, I remember going, I would be at a local rink in Rockford on like a Thursday night watching, uh, watching a men's league game. Oh, yeah, you look pretty good tonight. You want to come play for the Ice Hogs tomorrow night? And it was just a disaster. And, uh, you know, I, it kind of proved to me, like, I, I was good at the recruiting part. And I didn't handle the losing. I hate losing. And uh, it was just, you know, when the opportunity uh, – I, I remember I told my wife, it was probably mid-November when I came home, I said, don't unpack any more boxes. This isn't going to last. And with eight games or nine games left, they, I had just gotten thrown out of a game. I kind of blew a fuse and threw all the sticks and tape and water bottles and kind of was venting. Uh, from the last six months, everything landed on the ice, and the fans loved it. But uh, it got me a, got me a game suspension and uh, probably the rest of the year off because they let me go after that. And I, that's when I went over to Europe. And it was probably the best thing, that, you know, getting fired sucks, you know, just like getting cut from a team or anything. But it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me because it pointed me in the direction of going back over to Europe. And uh, that led me back to North America with a whole new set of tools in my toolbox. There's, there's no coach in the world who hasn't been fired at least once. So it's well, you're not doing life. your job right if you don't get fired the way I look at it. Um, you know, you're, you got to piss someone off at some point. And, uh, you know, it was funny because they – I had to go talk to the players because the players I, – I had a great group of guys. They were fantastic. They worked their – you know, with all the injuries, we were lucky we even had, you know, the record we had. And they worked extremely hard for me. They were all great players. And they were like, no, we're not going to play then. If you're firing Bernie, we're not playing. And, um, you know, a lot of those guys I still stay in touch with and, uh, it, it was fun, but, you know, I think more, when you're talking gong shows, Jamie, like when I first joined the Coast Hawk league in uh, my first year was 1989, 90 season, there was, I think seven teams in the league. And, uh, you know, I, I went to camp, uh, I went to Bruins rookie camp. It was in Hingham mass that year. And I went to, uh, they sent me down to Johnstown and I went to Johnstown and you know, anybody that's a true hockey fan knows that Johnstown is where they filmed the movie slap shot. Um, and the rink looked the exact same, like all those billboards that you see along the back wall and slap shot around the rink, they were all still hanging up. And my head coach was Steve Carlson, who was a Hanson brother. And I had a great camp, but I had a year of junior eligibility left. So I came home they said, you know, I, they got a Bruins contract goalie down at the last minute, so they returned me home. And uh, the rule in my my dad's household was you're going to school, you're working. And I was done school, so I, I got a job. Um, I was working for Door Brothers Meats on Highland Avenue there. And uh, mm -hmm. I was killing cows from 7 to 2 every day. And I was playing uh, the team in Owen Sound. I was ready to go back to them, and they thought – you know, I was staying, so they traded my rights to Brantford. They tried to uh, click one on Brantford, and then when I returned home, I'm like, I called I'll be up. He goes, I traded you to Brantford. I didn't think you were coming back. I, I thought I'd get a quick deal on them. So I was playing junior hockey for Brantford my last year at night, and I was uh, killing cows during the day, and 
it was just in January, beginning of January, I think I got a call on like a Wednesday night from or Thursday morning from Steve Carlson. And he's like, uh, we got a goalie injured and one called up. Can you come in, meet us in Erie on Friday night? Can you come with us for the weekend? I'm like, yeah, that'd be great. I remember I was all excited. You know, I'm sitting on the bench for a pro hockey game. Uh, it was one of the best teams in the league. And I'm sitting on the bench and, you know, your mind's everywhere. You're, you're not really watching what's on. You're more looking what's going around. And, all of a sudden it's four nothing like four minutes in the game or five minutes in the game and he yells down the bench at me to go in the net so the next thing I know I'm in the net and uh, I gave up two the rest of the way and had a good game I was really you know I was really happy that I even played and uh, he told me before we left you know I was following the bus back to Johnstown because we played at home Saturday Sunday and he goes you're starting Saturday night so I got the start Saturday night against the Nashville Knights they were called and uh Got my first win. Played again on Sunday afternoon, and we lost, but I had, like, I don't know, 50 shots or something like that. And uh, I went in to thank the coach. I said, thanks for ha having me. You know, you're interested next year, let me know. He's like, you're not going anywhere. I, I just got the other bully. You're staying here the rest of the year. And that was the best call that I ever got to make. I called my boss at the meatpacking company and quit right there. So I was with them the rest of the year, but – things in just that short little bit of we weren't a very good team we we're the last place team in the league and uh but the things that I saw in that league that year were just you know it was like mind-blowing and it was it was funny it was fun uh but the next summer I signed with uh, the Hampton Roads Admirals with John Brophy who I knew very well from coaching the Maple Leafs he was only two years removed from coaching the Toronto Maple Leafs and uh I went and played for him and my goaltending partner that year, we were affiliate with uh, Detroit Red Wings as well that first year there, uh, Washington and Detroit. So I get there, and my first four or five games, I'm just backing up, and I'm backing up Olaf Kolzig. And, uh, you know, first-round pick of the Caps, and I think we were 0-4-1. And, and I'm coming off the ice, and, you know, like, only 6-3, I'm 5-7, so it's, you know, kind of funny. And I look at the two together, and – unbelievable person, great partner. Um, I'm coming off the ice and Rofe would either call you a mule or a goaler. And, uh, he yells at me, goaler, can you win tonight? And I'm like, yeah. So he goes, well, then you're playing. So I started that night. It was a Friday night. And in, in uh, Hampton Roads, Norfolk, Virginia, back then, if you didn't have a ticket for a game on by Tuesday, Wednesday, you didn't get one. We were sold out every weekend, like 8,000 people. And an unbelievable place to play. And I get my first win that night, the team's first win of the year. Starts me on Saturday. I won again. And I got first star in both games. And I went on about a 10-game run where he played me. And then Washington called and said, what are you doing? Like, we, we didn't send our first rounders to sit on the bench. But um, the fans, I think that's what kind of, you know, got the fans on my side is they had this great big goaltender that was 6'3 and 6'4 and and – wasn't able to win it right away. And then in comes the midget and small guy and I win. And I remember my, uh, my second game, I come back on the Saturday night, I skate on the ice and behind my net, there was this huge bed sheet hanging and it had a, a goal, a net and it had a St. Bernard dog with my Jersey on it with the number 30. And it said, St. Bernard, this is his domain. That thing hung there for the next five, six years while I was playing there. And, uh, you know, those were the best days we, we played in front. We got treated like NHL players there. Our owner, Blake Cullen, was phenomenal. You know, we won the championship in 90-91, 91-92. And I remember that first year, 90-91, Ola, he got hurt late in the year. And Detroit sent us a goalie down by the name of Dave Gagnon, who was the big free agent signing that summer. But he had struggled at the American Hockey League level. And I remember uh, his contract was like at the time he was getting, I think 50 in the, in the American league, which was a big number. Um, he got a pretty good signing bonus, but he had a, the thing that why he signed with Detroit instead of the Rangers, they matched offers. And then I guess Detroit gave him a million dollars when he turned 40 and deferred money. And so he signed with Detroit and he was older cause he'd gone to school. He's probably four years older than me. So he And, you know, when you're 20, 21 years old, you want to be the guy in the playoffs. And I remember being pissed off. I'm not playing. You know, I've played 24, 25 games this year, and I'm not playing in the playoffs. 
But then I, you know, when you get older and you look back on it, we never would have won the championship that year if I had played. You know, I just wasn't ready for it. And being able to sit and watch Dave Gagnon play and, you know, the way he prepared for games and the way that he carried the team was, was phenomenal, you know, and it really prepared me for, for moving forward the next year. And I remember after we won the championship, John Brophy said to me, he goes, hey, next year this will be you. Don't worry about it. And Dave had been the playoff MVP and was just great for us. So the next year I come back, and not only do I have Olaf Colsey in our net, I have Byron Defoe there now too. And uh, those two were split in time between uh, Baltimore and Hampton Roads. And by Christmas, I had six games played when I came back to Hamilton for, for uh, Christmas. And John Brophy told me, he goes, listen, Christmas, they're both going to be on. Just hang in there. I came back after Christmas and uh, I played 48 games in a row. Um, they were both gone. I played 34 straight in the regular season and 14 more in the playoffs. And we won the championship again. And I was fortunate enough to be the playoff MVP. And But I was so much more prepared for it. And again, when you're young, you don't realize these things. It wasn't until later in my career I look back on it and I'm like, I wasn't ready to play that first year. Dave Gagnon gave me the education I needed on how to be that guy in the playoffs and how to win games. And, uh, you know, that was, that was huge for me and very lucky for me. I had a great relationship with John Brophy and he called me mule forever and I never understood it. And then later in life I was done. I think I was done. I was done playing and I went to see him and I said, why did you call me mule? He goes, well, what's a mule? I go, it's a jackass. It's a donkey. He goes, yeah, but what does it do? And I go, I don't know. It carries things. He goes, it carries the load. And that's exactly what you did for me every year. You carried the load. I went, oh, okay. So you, you liked me. And he goes, yeah, but I would never tell you that. But uh, he was he was fantastic. Like he was, you know, anybody that Googles John Brophy, it'll come up about 3,000 stories. But, you know, he was hard. But if you worked hard, he had all the time in the, in the world for you. He'd make you a better player. And uh, I loved playing for him. Well, I think that's a great way to end it. I mean, it's been it's been a good session. Unbelievable stories. Thank you very much for coming on. We really, we really, really appreciate it. No, I appreciate Bernie, that's the best and... storyteller we've had. Yeah. Well, amazing. I'm just sitting, I'm just one... sitting here. I'm listening. And I didn't even tell you the one about when we traveled in the back of the – we uh, traveled in the back of an 18-wheeler. <laughs> I'll have to – I'll <laughs> tell you that one quick. That one. I'll tell you that one quick. We, uh, so it would have been the 92-93 uh, season. My goalie partner was, you got to have Nick Vitusi on from Welland, Ontario. Nick Vitusi is the all-time games paid wins leader, Hall of Famer in the ECHL. He now scouts for the New Jersey Devils. He's from Welland, Ontario, played for the uh, Welland Far Mercury Junior B Cougars back in the day when I was playing for the Kilty Bees. We've known each other since we were 16 years old. He played for the Toronto Marlies. Uh, he was my goalie partner. Uh, playing for John Brophy's Hampton Roads Admirals. We played in Wheeling, West Virginia on like a Friday night. And we were playing in Raleigh, North Carolina on the Saturday. So our owner, again, who was fantastic, well, I'm going to fly you guys there. You're not buying all night. We're going to fly you. We were one of the only teams that would fly those places. So we had to bus after the game about hour. It's about an hour and 15 minutes to the Pittsburgh airport. And, uh, you know, we all pile on the bus. We get about 15 minutes into the night. It's a big snowstorm. You know, all of a sudden, the bus driver yells, get down. So, you know, what do you think happens? 20 hockey players look up. You know, they don't get down. They're all standing up looking what's happening. And a pickup truck had swerved into our lane, and we T-boned it. So the police come, amp fire. Nobody was injured, probably, and, but the police tell us, you can't drive your bus because the bus was, the front of it was a mess. He goes, drive it a half a mile up to the rest stop, to the truck stop, and wait for a new bus, but you can't proceed any, any farther with it. So as soon as we started driving, Tom Brophy's telling the bus driver, just drive the last, you know, out. We had about an hour and 10 minutes left. He goes, just get us to the airport hotel. Drive us back to the airport. And the bus driver's saying, no, I can't. I'll get in trouble. So John Brophy starts yelling at the bus driver, you're quitting on us. You're a quitter. You're quitting. And uh, we pull off, and, you know, we, Jamie, you've been in along on the way in there you're looking at uh you know all those different items they sell the big flashlights the coffee mugs that are like a small swimming pool and 
all of a sudden, John Brophy comes in. He's yelling at all of us to get our stuff off the bus and come right back here, be here in five minutes. So we're all standing there with our hockey bags and our duffel bags, and we're shivering, snowing out. We're like, what are we doing? All of a sudden, you know, this 18-wheeler pulls up. And, you know, you hear the air brakes go on, and the driver gets out, and he's walking to the back. He opens the back of the truck, and he goes, all right, boys, get in. And we're looking at each other like, what the hell is he talking about? And then John Brophy comes out with a coffee and goes, you heard him, get in the truck. So Broph had found this truck driver and uh, paid him a few hundred bucks. And it was, his truck was half full of office furniture. We all piled in the back of this 18 wheeler with our furniture. And I don't like these kind of things. Like I'm not big on trapped, you know, I'm kind of claustrophobic. And, and one player that nobody really, you know, cared for, we let him ride up front with the driver. So, we're all piling the back, including John Brophy. And uh, you hear that those double doors shut and the click, you know, the lock. And there's no lights back there. Uh, John Brophy had like one of those little pen light flashlights and he was holding it under his chin. You could see every scar on his face and he's, and he's telling us stories about when he played. And uh, you hear the driver shut his door, the air brake release, the truck fire up and it starts shaking and you get going down the highway and the wind's blowing and you're like, Oh my God, if we get an accident, they're not going to look for any people back here. <laughs> we pull up in front about an hour and hour and 10 minutes later, we pull up in front of like a Hilton. We always stayed at nice house, like a Hilton or a Ramada or something, Pittsburgh airport. We hear the air brakes go on and the driver's door shut. We hear the door click and open up and out piles. Like we look like the bad news bears. We pile out of the back of this 18 wheel wheeler with a hockey bed and all this everybody in the bar uh, it was a big bar window that looked out to the parking lot and they're looking out the window like are, are we seeing this right like all these guys piling out of the back of this truck the next day we flew to raleigh i was supposed to start i couldn't i was rattled still and nick Fatusi played last minute and stood on his head for it. and uh you know it, it was just you if you did that today as a coach you'd have 20 agents on your phone the next day you probably have the police at your door, but, uh, you know, it was just, I don't know who had the foresight, but someone ran in and bought one of those, remember those cool old Kodak cardboard, uh, disposable cameras. So I have two pictures from in the truck that night before they closed the door. And, uh, it's, it's phenomenal that we did that. And, but, you know, like I said, Nick Fatusi is a guy you got to have on and, uh, you know, he was – Nick is a guy that was so loosey-goosey when he played. He'd be – he could give up eight goals in a game. He'd go out singing the theme song from that show, Eight is Enough, that night. It didn't bother him. Where I was very uptight, very professional, very focused, and he was just loosey-goosey. And I remember playing for Charlotte one night, and I was playing for Hampton still. And I'm stretching on one side of the center ice line, and his partner – uh Ken Shep, I think it was, he played, he was a Binghamton Ranger draft, or New York Ranger draft pick. He's stretching on the other side, and I'm playing Ken that night. We're talking, and in those days, you didn't wear your goalie. You know, you'd send your goalie mask out to the bench, and, you you know, you'd get the flow going, and you'd go out and shoot pucks with no mask on. you just throw it on just as you went net for warm-up. So we're stretching, and I see Nick doing something at our bench, and he steals one of my sticks, my backup sticks. And he comes across with a puck and he goes to shoot it at me. Well, I'm ready for it. He shoots it, but it gets away from him because I've got a big hook on my stick. And he hits his partner right in the face and <laughs> like eight stitches. And uh, so Nick has to play and he stands on his head and beats us like three to two or something like that. But like the look on his face, like soon as the puck left his stick, he knew he was like, oh no. And I was like, oh, no. And Ken Shepard never even saw it come and hit him right in the face. And uh, you'll have to, you know, that's a – if you get tell them stories like this, they you keep popping back up in your memory bank. But um, in the East Coast, like back in those days, there were so many things that happened. And, you know, some you like sharing and some were, were stories that are just shared amongst the boys. But uh, it was a fun time and the best time in my life, and I wouldn't, wouldn't change it for the world. Well, that's, a, that's an amazing way to end it right Luck the rest of the way. And, Thanks uh, so much, guys. I appreciate it. And uh, 
stay safe. And hopefully when I can uh, get back home here, I'll stop in for a visit. Awesome. Tell Jackson uh, we all said hello too. I will, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. Take care, guys. Thanks.